Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Rudy Bachlin. Rudy is an associate professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame and a research affiliate at the Center for Economic Policy Research, a leading European economic think tank. Rudy has published widely on macroeconomic issues in top journals and is an active member of the German Economic Association. He also blogs and writes popular press articles for the German media. Today he joins us to talk about German macroeconomics, as well as some of his own research. Rudy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Oh, we're glad to have you on. Looking forward to our conversation. Um, I ask all macroeconomists who come on the show the same question that I'll ask you. How did you get into macroeconomics? I know, I know this question, and I was <laughs> thinking I'm going to have a very different response than anyone else you have had so far okay. on the show. Because the reason is actually a woman, believe it or not. <laughs> now, that's a great story I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to hear the story. Yes. So I've if I remember, so a lot of people, you know, a lot of American economists say, you know, they had this great already high school classes in economics, and that's how they got inspired. And then they had these great teachers in economics in college, and that's how they got into economics. Yes. I had none of that okay. at all, for reasons which we actually probably will talk a bit about. The uh, You know, economics is not part of the high school curriculum at all in Germany. So I wasn't exposed to economics uh, uh, during high school time. Yeah. That was nil, basically. The, the two economics lessons from my somewhat lefty uh, uh, social science teachers basically were free trade is bad because it exploits the, free world, uh, the, the, the third world and, uh, you know, the government should do uh, deficit spending. Basically, that's how that was my economic knowledge going into college. And indeed, um, so I didn't major at all in, in economics first. So I, I was a more of a literary Nazi uh, type, if you can imagine. Huh. I sometimes uh, I can't imagine anymore. But anyway, um, and, you know, I, my main my main uh, major was actually uh, comparative literature and philosophy in Spanish as a minor. OK, that's how I started out. with. So, and then sort of the first semester undergraduate um you know, unlike in the U.S., we do sort of we do our major. We start with our major right away. There's not so much liberal arts education anymore. Uh -huh. And after the first semester, I was thinking I was sitting in this comp literature class, and I was like, "This, this ain't for me. This is just, I'm not gonna be happy here. This is just mumbo jumbo. I have no idea what these guys are talking about." And so, at the time, my then girlfriend, uh, or my ex girlfriend, I should say, um, uh, she was actually studying business administration. Um, at a at a different university, and so I studied with her for her for her um, uh, for her you know exams, accounting exams, and but also economics exams because they had to take some economics classes. And I figured, wow, that's kind of interesting. That stuff, you know, hmm. that's social science. But I always was good in math in high school. There's also a lot of math and calculation stuff. So I figured that that's kind of interesting, and that's. That's basically when I decided I need to I need to uh, shed some of this more humanities type stuff. I kept some of it on. I actually ended mm -hmm. up double majoring in philosophy and in economics. Um, but uh, uh, so yeah, that's where I decided I needed to do something else. And ba frankly, she go gave me the idea, and I tried it out, and I fell in love. Uh, I just fell in love with her, but I fell I fell oh, wow. in love with economics, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, it stayed with me ever since. And then you know, I had good teachers at at my undergraduate college in, in Germany, and then obviously going to Yale was, that's basically what sealed the okay. deal then, you know, making this big step from a local university, uh, uh, not very well known in Germany, to, you know, the big stage in the United States. That's the story. So I got into economics at least. And then macroeconomics, that has always been, I was always interested more in the big questions and not so much in nitty-gritty detail questions. So what was this young lady's name? <laughs> Christina. <laughs> well, we can thank Christina for making the world a better place by her influence on you. We now have your research, your work. This is the butterfly effect, right? Uh, via economics. Uh, yes. So, okay, it's very interesting. So you're now at, at Notre Dame, and um, you're in the Department of Economics there. And one of the interesting things that you've done is you, you've commented on this approach to macroeconomics which is the German perspective, the German macroeconomics. You've written some posts on this. You've commented on it. And 
it's interesting because I, I think many American observers will sometimes sit back and ask, what is the government of Germany doing? Why aren't they doing things the way we would prescribe them? Or you know, something I've looked at more closely is the European Central Bank, at least up until Mario Draghi and his QE programs. We thought they were being way too tight, maybe way too cautious. And I, I think you have some perspective to shed on this. Um, there's, there's a certain perspective that the Germans bring to bear on macroeconomics that's, that's different than the Anglo-American perspective. Yeah, I think part of it is perception, and I think part of it is actually substance. Okay. So I, I want to start with the perception. I think sort of as far as, in a very narrow sense, uh, academic macroeconomics is concerned, that has been largely a transitory phenomenon. It's true that German economics, and therefore German macroeconomics, was a bit insulated after the after the after World War II, essentially, yeah? okay. and, and I'll talk a bit more about that maybe a bit later. But you know that that sort of that's now several decades ago, and sort of that I would argue has largely that gap has largely closed. Right. In other words, young German macroeconomists, whether they are trained in the United States or trained in Germany, they write essentially the same papers, they use the same methods. Uh, they use the same framework uh, uh, frameworks than U.S. trained economists are uh, would do, and so there is no I, I, there is no daylight between the two. So, and they are you know also successful. These are not sort of uh, sort of provincial. Uh, there's a good young macroeconomics uh, tradition uh, in Germany that that plays the international game and is part, frankly, of the international academic conversation in macroeconomics. The question is a bit, you know, why aren't the apparent, why aren't these guys apparently more heard in the policy circles, okay? Um, uh, why isn't German economic policy uh, following them much more, yes. okay? First of all, you could argue there's a, there's a question, I'm going to sidestep this, I'm just going to mention this, there's a question, is really U.S. macroeconomic policy listening so much to, you know, recommendations of uh, leading macroeconomists in the world. For example, did we, have enough, did we have enough sti fiscal stimulus? A lot of, uh, you know, um, U.S. macroeconomists would argue we didn't have enough. And to the extent that the federal government had it, uh, the states basically undercut it so that uh, in net we didn't have it. But I'm going to sidestep that issue. That's sure. a, a whole uh, other debate. Okay, and um, I think part of it is a uh, in Germany. Part of it is, of course, maybe just um, you know still a transitory phenomenon in the sense that you know these young guys they still have a lot of they want to publish. They still want to play the academic game. So they're still a bit you know uh, shy uh, sort of going. Uh, so it's basically just a life cycle issue in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. Versus sort of they just haven't matured enough. That generation that plays the international game hasn't matured enough to actually say, okay, now I have published you know my third AER or something. It's enough. Uh, I'm going to go into in, into policy circles. So that's I think part of it. But I don't think it explains the, the the whole the whole thing. So 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 now the question is what sort of more deeply structural, uh, potentially different in the way uh, Germans approach uh, economic policy more generally and macroeconomic policy. And I think that has that actually, in my view, and now we have to go back a bit, um, has sort of deep deep historical roots, both in terms of the history of thought, uh, uh, sort of if you want to say it in big words, sort of the philosoph philosophical traditions in Germany, but also sort of the way uh, Germany became a nation, okay? Okay. Um, so, if, if, and, and let's go back actually to the 19th century. I think that's, uh, that's, where, that's where we need to start, uh, I think, to understand that. In the 19th century, Germans were already special because they were obviously the last to become, or the last of the major states in Europe, at least to become a nation. And so, so this nation building in the 19th century, when sort of liberal philosophical thought upon which a lot of um, the, the Anglo-Saxon American economics framework was built, uh, you know, was, uh, so it was just not a topic in Germany. It didn't, it didn't get read by sort of the, the, at the time, social philosophers or political philosophers at the time, right? So they were much more concerned with this sort of nation building, you know, sort of much more perhaps mercantilistic and sort of a lot of this liberal thought, this liberal framework, and then the stuff that came out of it, the neoclassical framework, the marginal rev uh, marginalist revolution, I don't think this was sort of really played a major role in, in, in German discourse. And then, of course, and th th that's what so one thing special. And then, and then you had uh, basically with, um, and then you had the Nazi regime with a, 
with a very sort of very statist economy, essentially a command economy. It's not It's not that, I mean, there's a reason why it's called National Socialist Party, right? Mm -hmm. It was in that sense, an extremely command, a command economy. And so basically with almost 100 years a, a delay in the 1950s, there was sort of uh, this group of economists that finally tried to establish sort of general liberal thought, general liberal uh, philosophy uh, into German discourse. And, and and at the time, I think it was quite necessary. And quite frankly, the Americans were probably happy about it because, you know, if you look back at this, if you look actually at the historical records, it wasn't clear at all, uh, you know, sort of in the early beginnings of the, of the new republic in Germany, that this would become a, a market economy with flexible prices and sort of you know, there, there, there were honest debates, tough debates about whether it should become more like a command economy, because the debate, you know, which type of economy, capitalist or more command based economy at the time wasn't decided at all. Now, with the hindsight yeah. of 70 years, we know it is decided historically, but at the time that wasn't at all clear. So, you know, the Americans were probably happy that we had these sort of what they call the auto liberals, which is sort of a, a, a framework that sort of that sort of. Um, um, you know, sort of uh, very rules-based. Uh, the government should set rules, and then uh, uh, basically uh, to, to to rules so that both democracy can flourish, but also a free market economy, uh, free competitive market economy can flourish. But of course, historically, that came a bit late. You know, <laughs> because at the time, economically in Anglo-Saxon countries, we had other problems and other things were discussed, like Keynes' uh, a theory of uh, of deficiency of aggregate demand, Keynes' theory of the Great Depression, which mm -hmm. Basically, again, wasn't really, you know, taken into account in German economic discourse. That sort of only appeared in sort of the 70s when already sort of the problems of German economics occurred. So Germany was always a bit behind the frontier. Okay. And that had to do with sort of its, its sort of general delay in, in, in nation building. So that's sort of one strand sort of that explains why especially what's called auto liberals still have basically sort of a lot of power grip in terms of economic policy advising in Germany. It's that they played an important role, okay? They had a role to play in the 50s mm -hmm. and 60s to make sure that Germany actually became a market economy. And that's sort of, and, and they're still surviving in some sense uh, in, terms of, in terms of influence. Now, the other thing I think that's important is to notice is I would say German mentality, a German philosophy, a much more, sort of um, um, sort of a view of the state as sort of as some something sort of as a principal uh, um, agent in and of itself rather than a means to an end sort of that and that's sort of the difference to anglo-saxon pragmatism where the state is essentially a means to an end and um, and uh, and you know sometimes it's good that the state intervenes and 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 does things and sometimes it's not and it's kind of state dependent and it's you know sort of case by case versus the Germans have this view of the state as an entity sui generis if you wish that sort of has its own rationality and sort of just as a as a little anecdote to sh to illustrate this a lot of faculties uh, economics departments in Germany for traditional reasons actually called state sciences so not a social science as it would be clearly in in the huh. Anglo-Saxon world, but they're called the state science, sort of how to run the state, basically. Rather, that's the tradition um, that, where they where they come from. Now, on sort of paradoxically, that means that on the one hand, they they have sort of uh, 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 at the same time these auto liberals, these sort of rule rules based guys in German policy, have on the one hand sort of a skepticism about the power of the state, and I think quite frankly a healthy skepticism mm -hmm. about the power of the power of the state. They think very much about political economy issues, for example, right? Um, but then they also sort of want to leave. Uh, they don't think that the state should should beyond that rules framework. Okay, the state should uh, do be, uh, um, much beyond that. On the other hand, sort of uh, uh, the Anglo-Saxon macroeconomic pragmatists have a much more sort of, you know, relaxed view of the state and sometimes the state should intervene or not. But on the other hand, from the German point of view, they would say they have a bit of a naive view of the power of the state, of the influence of the state and sort of its own inner work in, in terms of political economy. And to be fair, that's I think is a fair criticism, right? I mean, the, the state in our standard macroeconomic neo-Keynesian models is a very simple entity, right? And all right. things like political economy, uh, you know, bureau bureaucracy and all these things just never appear. And when, when American macroeconomists, you know, just say do this and that, 
you know, I don't know, increase government spending, then sort of a lot of these political economy considerations that come with it, uh, you know, are a bit naive, naively swept under the rug, I would say. It's just they, the, the problem is that uh, if people to be heard, I guess, in the meat, in the modern media, they go a lot often to these very extreme positions. And so, you know, Krugman doesn't care about, a guy like Krugman never cares about political economy. And sort of our guys at home sometimes are stubbornly uh, clinging to the idea that the state should never under any circumstances, you know, uh, 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 help the help the uh, the economy just because it's against the rules. And so, and so just to finish this up, and so because it, for a lot of people, especially in the, in the, in the, in the policymaking arena, um, they view this as, as the state as something very important, as this rules maker, they come, uh, and, and the order liberalism, if you, if you look at their writings, they are basically like, they, they argue like lawyers, not, not so much like, uh, Anglo-Saxon trained economists, which are much more sort of flexible about rules. Sometimes you have to have rules, but sometimes you need to break them depending on the situation, right? They're very much about rules. And so they're very, they argue a lot like lawyers. And you can see this, a lot of the sort of the, the scientific, the academic influence in these ministries with Schäuble, the finance minister, or the, the, the minister of commerce. These are a lot of people that argue like lawyers and not like economists. And that's basically where this strict rules, uh, uh, this insistence on rule-basedness of, of economic policy comes from and this very clear sort of, um, you know, aversion to discretionary uh, um, uh, influences in, the, in, in macroeconomic policy. Okay, I'm going to come back to those two, those two forces there you've, you've said. One's kind of a generational kind of catching up uh, with, with, re- with understandings in other places. But the other one, your, your second point there is kind of the sanctity of the state itself and how it's viewed differently. One, one thing you've, you noted in your writings I found interesting is, and you alluded to this, is that economists over there do not hold the same stature as they do in the U.S. Where in the U.S., it, 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 it seems like, and, and many other you know, academics get frustrated with economists because they're the final arbiters, the final judges of what's good policy and what's not. You know, We have the Paul Krugmans, we have Larry Sumner's, People who are- oh, I think this actually, but it's not just that. If you look, there's this. I don't know whether you've seen this. There's a beautiful graph that jo- uh, Justin Wolfers at some point put out in the in the upshot in the New York Times. Mm-hmm. They basically just plots a Google a Google search, a Google news search, I think, plots about sort of uh, newspaper articles mentioning economists versus historians, uh, political scientists, and uh, and other social scientists. And sort of the economists just basically have been dominating <laughs> that public discourse. Right. Uh, and sort of uh, marginalizing political scientists or historians, for example, um, it's just an absolutely interesting right. phenomenal graph. Right. And so, I don't think you would have that in Germany, quite frankly. Right. And so that that was interesting. So, you know, the Paul Krugman of the world, they, they have newspaper columns in the New York Times. Um, but in Germany, what you argue, and you, you point out that the lawyers are the ones with the most stature, the most esteem, and they're the ones that are listened to. So the finance minister, who's pretty well known, um, He's a listens, lawyer, right? He, y- yes, and he listens to lawyers, the the the, the, the people around him. So okay. I, I don't know that Germans are so much into blogging. So I, I'm not going <laughs> to say that there are a lot of lawyer bloggers that mm-hmm. sort of uh, influence public discourse. That's just a, a maybe a more American thing, and the Germans will can, catch up again in 20 years or something. Um, but um, yeah, the sort of the inner circle, the academic inner circles, a lot of them are lawyers, not exclusively, but a lot of them. Uh, are lawyers and argue for, sort of from a legalistic uh, uh, framework. That's in, indeed the case. And sort of the other thing that's interesting, and that sort of Germans uh, um, uh, love for philosophers, is, you know, a, a guy like Jürgen Habermas, for example, you know, eminent social philosopher of the critical theory type Frankfurt School, he would have much more sort of newspaper if he says that he pronounces something about uh, euro breakup or Brexit or anything European, for example, that has mm-hmm. eminent that where you where you would think someone would need eminent uh, economic expertise to say something competently, he would get much bigger newspaper space than any economist in Germany, and he would be listened to uh, uh, to by the by the intelligentsia. That's certainly true, and you know, sort of ec- economics. Coming sort of, and you can see this. There's this. There's this somewhat pejorative German word, Krämerseele, 
okay, which is uh, which is a, someone is a bit stingy, a bit nitpicky, sort of a small-minded person in some sense. But the first word, the first word, grammar, is an is sort of an old is an old uh, an, somewhat an old-fashioned expression for businessman in some sense, for someone mm. who trades stuff. Okay. And so it's this and it's sort of the the. the, the Germans have this all sort of deeply rooted aversion to anything uh, related to commerce, trade, business, and by extension, I guess, economics. That's something very deeply rooted. That's very, okay? very and, interesting. And um, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> well, let me, I want to come back in a minute and, and mention what, an economist here uh, that I was reading about who was very influential in some of this thinking as well. But I wanted to, maybe we need to, for our listeners, kind of go and summarize exactly what is you know the german perspective now i'm i'm drawing upon this article in vox by peter boffinger and mm-hmm. and he he suggested three things and if you want to correct those or add to those let me know but his three things that would define german macroeconomics would be number 1 a, almost a religious dedication to balanced fiscal budgets so there's no such thing as a counter cyclical you know, balanced budget where the, you run a deficit during the recession, run surpluses during the good years, and balance over the business cycle. It's just pure, hardcore, all the time, um, balanced budget, number one. Number two, a, a, a strong commitment to price stability, um, almost to a fault. He mentions that they want to, if, if they're going to err, they err on the side of, of disinflation or you know, going down. They, they would definitely be in favor of a asymmetric inflation target. So, the, the, uh, for example, the European Central Bank's target is is you know just under two percent, and and for them, if they go down to one percent, no problem. The more the more the better. And the third thing is price flexibility. So let relative prices do their work, um, but really stress price flexibility as the solution to a mass unemployment problem or what you mentioned before, aggregate demand deficiency. Let price flexibility be the solution. Um, and as a consequence, if you're going to focus on price flexibility. You've got to get the structural reforms right. So, you know, Germany had the big uh, wage, the unions, uh, wage cuts for unions. So they stress structural reform as a way to get price flexibility. So they list, he lists those three things. Is that an accurate list of the German macro perspective? I would say yes and no. Um, but a part, part of this is I, I want to sort of frame this a bit more uh, again, going back to this rules based thing, right? So the fiscal. Balanced fiscal budget is sort of a rule that kind of makes sense from a legalistic sure. point of view. It's like an easy rule, right? It's like right. it's sort of it, it's it's you know it's an it's just from introspection. It's it's subject to the uh, obviously to the fallacy of composition. You know that's something that a household should do, a private household probably should do. Yeah. So it's sort of and again, law of price stability is sort of an easy rule. Okay. Right. Um, so so I think that's part of this. Uh, this is just this very formalistic argument, rather than the more nuanced thing that you know, fis- balanced budget are sometimes a good idea and sometimes not a good idea. Okay. And 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 price flexibility may sometimes be a good idea and sometimes be not so, such a good idea and, and the same with uh, 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 with inflation right sort of this uh, so, um, partly again I think um, um, and by the way just as an aside here so one needs to be a bit careful and I think which has to do with the fact that sort of a, a lot of criticism obviously about so what's called now German macroeconomics whatever that is supposed to be um, is coming from certain political figures namely for uh, the Krugmans of the world right <laughs> right all the all the three pillars you have just mentioned uh, if you interview John Cochrane he would probably you know nod and say, mm-hmm. Not bad macroeconomics. Right. Like, I was actually thinking about him when I read this, and and and, so, and he's an American, okay? Well, and and, and as honestly, American as apple pie. Some so, of, the, some of these things I like too. I mean, some of these things are are reasonable uh, perspectives to hold. Exactly. So, it's, so it's not it's sort of it's a bit of a sort of a political strategy, of course, in the in the yes. in the in the ideological di- discourse to sort of brand that uh, these stupid Germans they haven't caught up to the newest right okay. to the newest macroeconomic right. ideas. There would be a lot of a lot of U.S. macroeconomists uh, that uh, that would uh, subs- uh, subscribe to that. Right. But it is sort of that, uh, and and then. Um, the other thing, and that's and a sort of uh, uh, another German macroeconomist actually ha- has made some of these points, I think, in a very compelling way. Uh, Michael Burda, um, one of the f- former presidents of the German Economic Association, in a letter to the to the uh, actually the Royal Economic Society uh, in Britain, uh, uh, the Royal Economic uh, Society in Britain, um, 
where he basically argued, you know, some of these things have nothing to do with ideology. They are basically reflecting of, uh, you know, German self-interest. Okay, um, and just just maybe to give you an example, the the uh, um, the ba- uh, the ba- the balanced budget rule, for example. Okay, mm-hmm. it's not clear that from a German perspective, as a very open economy, you know, um, uh, expansionary fiscal policy is 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 all that optimal. From a purely now, you could argue the Germans have should have an interest in sort of keeping the eurozone together, and maybe that's a long run interest. And indeed, from a long run perspective, they should do more. But from a purely very short on self-interest, it's not clear that even if the fiscal multiple worked, if you have a lot of imports going to abroad, I mean, that's what Brugman wants to stabilize the South, but it's not clear that it would actually help the German economy much, okay? So so, so th- th- that sort of this, that explains perhaps some of this, you know, uh, aversion about, uh, about uh, you know, or against expansionary fiscal policy. Um, okay. Um, and the other thing about sort of price flexibility, supply side reforms, Germans in their recent experience actually, you know, at least sort of prima facie saw that it worked, which uh, you mentioned is the so-called hard sphere reforms or hard reforms actually for them, which basically the, the social democrat uh, Chancellor Schröder in the early noughties basically uh, introduced. And it actually led to, you know, successful uh, to a, a, sex, a successful revamping of the German economy. Out of a time where Germany, let's not forget, around the 2000s, Germany, the famous article in The Economist was called the sick man of Europe. And sick men meant economically sick, okay? And, you know, Germany got out of that. So from their narrow perspective, you know, supply-side reforms actually worked. Now, we can debate whether this was due to the fact that they had a fixed exchange rate and they undercut their competitors and they didn't play by the rules, uh, as Krugman would argue, probably, um, uh, by the, uh, of a currency union. And that's a fair argument. But that's a much more sort of indirect thing for sort of they basically see or saw that their supply side reforms work so from their national self-interest they would say why don't you guys do it too right right that right. may be a misunderstanding of how currency unions work i'm not i'm there's a point to be made but just sort of from a very narrow self sure. self perspective uh, point of view that's certainly the case and inflation in particular i think that and that is indeed a bit puzzling i will argue i will uh, i will admit that um, and actually we will probably talk about this uh, in the second part of it when we talk about you know is inflation raising inflation even such a good idea but uh, sort of even independently of that it is true that for some reasons the hyperinflation in the interval period that's still something even though it's so long ago almost 100 years now that's still something that sort of almost gets I want to say transmitted with the with the mother milk, you know, that sort of goes into the psyche, right. the national the, psyche of the, the Germans. In the and DNA. You can see this in 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 survey after survey that people have looked at um, um, uh, uh, what's towards attitudes against inflation. Inflation is somehow in Ger- infl- fear of inflation is in Germans' mind, and um, I'm not defending this. Maybe this is part of the national psychosis. Um, and uh, uh, um, but uh, it is what it is. So 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 part of it is tradition, historical experience. Part of it is is also ideology, of course, but or a blind ideology. But part of it is also, I would argue, national self interest. It is interesting to see this this emphasis on inflation, and, and from my perspective, it seems almost an excessive concern about inflation. Um, and yet, there, you know, there's a historical precedent, of course, the early 1920s. That was a, a big event. But what I, I guess I find puzzling, and I'm hoping, Rudy, you can shed some perspective on this, since you know the German macroeconomic perspective better than most people, is that even though you know, the, the Germans went through that horrible experience of the early 1920s, they also went through the Great Depression. They also had deflation in the late 20s, early 30s. And, and there's been some studies who argue that played a pivotal role in bringing you know, Hitler and the Nazis to power. That was a, a, a key catalyst. And so you know, the, the, the Great Depression, in some ways, was just as damaging as the hyperinflation. And yet it's, it seems, and again, I may be mistaken, but it seems that uh, Germans tend to remember only the hyperinflation episode. So why do you think they forget the Great Depression so much? That's a good question, and I don't think I have an answer to that. Quite frankly, I I fully agree with you. That's the obvious question that one should ask. Um, maybe it's because you know there was another not hyperinflation, but 
strong inflation in the 70s mm-hmm. and sort of a social democratic government sort of, you know, in, uh, in defiance of sort of the Lucas critique and what you can do with the Phillips curve basically actually thought that the Phillips curve is something that's politically exploitable. Uh, led to sort of somewhat tumultuous years in the 70s, okay? Um, you know, obviously when I talk about hyperinflation, but we're talking about inflation rates, I don't know, 8 to 10% or something like that. Um, and, and, and maybe that's that. Maybe that's part of it, where this got sort of a bit, uh, a bit out of control. I, I'm purely speculating here. Yeah, I've seen prominent Germans, for example, uh, I believe is the individual, the, the, I don't know if he's the prime minister back then, but the, the leader of Germany right after World War II, they interviewed him in, when he was older, or uh, and and he, you know, he drew the link between the hyperinflation of the twenties and Hitler, and he said, "Oh, that's the reason Hitler was here is because of the hyperinflation." And, and I, I was just, you know, I was like, "I'm an American, and I know better than that." <laughs> I mean, it, it, that's that's a, that's a stretch to go from one. It may have played some role, maybe it got the ball rolling, and some social breakdown occurred. But the Great Depression was at least as consequential. So, absolutely, I, 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 I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm myself a bit puzzled about this national obsession but you know to a certain extent these things um i think at some at some point i guess e- economics has to be quiet has to yeah that's a fair point has to, has to shut up and the psychiatry he has to <laughs> well this sounds to, like a great great uh research topic for someone out there to to fully explore and write some books on articles on so now i, I want to move forward and and, and we'll come back to, to the point as we move forward, come back to the point you made earlier, that this German perspective actually worked for Germany. Um, and you mentioned inflation did go up in the in the 70s. You said maybe 8% or so. But w- one thing Don't that... Don't quote me on that. I wouldn't need to go okay, back. Okay. It but, was uh, higher than usual. Higher uh, than had, usual. They, they had relatively high public sector unions, uh, wage increases, for example, that, okay. that, that led to big budget deficits that were somewhat permanent. And so, uh, sort of that, that that sort of was a bit of a tumultuous. That was uh, and this was pr- uh, uh, sort of um, prefaced by by relatively uh, uh, tumultuous public sector union strikes. So this is sort of a bit of okay. a you know just again just in terms of associations, a time of high public uh, uh, sector union wage deals, higher inflation, people on the street, people on the street, um, sort of a somewhat a, a, just an era of you know, somewhat social instability. Now, obviously, nothing compared to what we had in the 1920s and the 1930s. But you know, something that 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 sort of was a, a bit of a, a a a counterpoint to the relatively golden era, at least economically, maybe not societally, but economically of the 1950s and 60s, where you had sort of these, you know, phenomenal uh, 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 times of just catch-up growth, right, uh, um, uh, in Germany, and sort of the so-called Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle that sort of Germans always talk about. And so this was the first time after the war that things didn't look quite so good anymore, right? Like, yes. And maybe, and maybe that's that's just part of it. Now, you could argue unemployment was also higher in the 70s. So, you know, what... Again, it's at some point, as I said, it's a matter for for a, a psychiatrist. Well, I, I'm looking at <laughs> the beauty of, of you know doing this interview and having the internet in front of me right here. I'm I'm now looking at Fred data, Germany's CPI, looking at the inflation rate, and it peaks about looks like seven and a half, almost eight percent in the mid 70s, um, but it goes down. It is it doesn't last very long. Um, and I, I guess the point I was going to make is that actually they may have been high for the Germans, but that was actually relatively good performance compared to what happened in the U.S. and the U.K. Absolutely. Well, the Bundesbank was actually deciding against and giving trouble to the government at that time because they had this very strong monetarist uh, Milton Friedman influenced uh, sense. So they, they had Walker, I guess, a bit earlier. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so interesting. So, you know, it's, it's, that's a case where you have monetary dominance. Over fiscal dominance. Yes, there. and you can see this sort of until sort of the ECB, the Bundesbank has been, and it probably still is, although it doesn't do much anymore, it's still one of the most respected institutions in Germany. If you were to run a public survey, and I'm, 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 I'm blanking on specific ones, I'm pretty sure uh, you can find that online. If you were to run a survey, who is sort of one of the major public institutions? It would be the Supreme Court and the Bundesbank. Absolutely no doubt about it, especially in earlier times, right? They, they have this, this idea of being tough guys that are, mm-hmm. you know, play by the rules and, you know, help the common worker or something. I, I don't know. This is just something that Germans, you know, are proud of. Um, so 
Yeah, so you, you see a much better macroeconomic performance in terms of low inflation during this period. So I, my, I guess my point is, despite the challenges they had during that time, um, these, these German rules seem to work better. They seem to have a better you know, in, inflation outcome during the 70s than what happened in the U.S. So there's something to be said for that. And also the, the productivity growth pickup they had when they, you mentioned they had in the uh, early 2000s with the wage reforms. Um, so that you know, there you're right. There, there's some su- success they can point to and say, "Hey, this has worked for us." Um, interestingly, you know, Ben Bernanke. But again, I mean, the, the obvious counter argument, and I'm, I'm, I'm in full agreement with yeah. with uh, sort of the Keynesians here is, it, it, of course, if you have a, if you live in a monetary union with a fixed exchange rate regime sure. and you constantly undercut your uh, competitors, uh, sure, they they could do that too. But then all you get is sort of. Um, it's 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 not the the point is sort of this relative competitiveness is always a relative uh, uh, thing. Not not everyone can become more competitive, right? We can, everyone every nation can become more productive over time, but not every nation can become more competitive in that sense because it's a relative, it's it's just a relative thing, right? And so and uh, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, they benefited obviously uh, quite a bit from uh, sort of from being um, you know a large country sort of within a monetary union, but still a relatively open and small open economy that doesn't necessarily influence world prices. Yes. And I think that's sort of, that's sort of uh, where these supply side reforms actually work in that context. And it's not so clear that this would necessarily be a model for the United States or necessarily a, a model for the, the more per, uh, per, peripheral countries. Yes. Um, and, and, and in fact, you see that, that critique uh, today. In fact, this article by Peter Boffinger, he concludes, well, why has Germany been so successful? He argues despite the German model, he argues it's been feeding off you know, demand growth from the rest of the world. I mean, even now, people are calling you know, for Germany to, to uh, spend more to kind of you know, shore up the rest of the European Union. So I, that, that's a fair point. That'd be the, the, the critique to what they have argued and what they have said. Um, I, I want to bring up one individual's name. And because in this article I, by Peter Boffinger, he, he argues he was a very important individual in the thought of, of German economics. And so he, the lawyers who, who decide policy, who, who shape policy, they point to this Walter, is it Eucken? Eucken, Walter Eucken. Walter yes. Eucken. So mm-hmm. w- was he truly an influential uh, figure in, in economic thought in Germany? Absolutely. I mean, he basically single handedly is a so called Freiburg school. He single-handedly uh, sort of, you know, dominated the academic discourse. I would say, in the 50s and 60s. Then the Keynesians did come in, and for a very short time. So in that sense, it's actually not quite true that Germans never uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, were interested or never you know, took took up Keynesian ideas. The seven the Social Democrat uh, government were actually very Keynesian uh, 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 fiscal policy, right? Uh, that was sort of the heydays of Keynesianism. And there are entire institutions in Germany essentially built around uh, a Keynesian counter-cyclical fiscal policy ideas. So it's not true that Germans aren't aware of this. It's just that, you know, th- with some trouble in the 70s, you know, like everywhere else, Keynesian uh, ideas became uh, came a bit in disrepute. It's a bit like it. It's not unlike the United States. And then, uh, and then the question is, how fast could they surface, sort of in the more recent times? And there, obviously, the apparently the U.S. had more Keynesians still surviving, versus <laughs> in Germany they bear, they they indeed were sort of yes. were, were essentially banned, uh, had been banned from the political economy. Well, but, what's, but, what's, so, but certainly he influenced acad- academic uh-huh. German uh, German economic academia and uh, and um, uh, and uh, and uh, again until the 50s 60s I would say partly in some major universities even until the 1980s 1990s and he has his, his ideas still dominate uh, German public policy uh, right. economic policy advice right. and indeed and indeed sort of as I said, that, that that guy from the perspective of the fifties, I would to, I would on the one hand defend that guy because it was necessary after this very statist anti-liberal economy that the Nazis built up. They did many other bad things, obviously, but this was sort of part of it. Okay, the Germans just had never experienced really a liberal economy. Okay, and sort of introducing these ideas of you know of competition, of price flexibility, stable money. 
this is this is a complete revolution in Germany at the time. Okay, and there were major forces, especially on the social democratic side, that were much more in favor. The, the social democrats at the time were much more socialists. Okay, and then sort of in the fifties, basically they became social democrats and in favor of a market economy with then sort of corrective measures, uh, redistributive and corrective measures. But the the, the the sort of the policy debate in the early fifties, uh, late forties, uh, you know, wasn't this decided at all and so and and this guy with his school of thought actually made sure that germany you know became a market a liberal market uh, economy with you know social uh, some uh, uh, social policy uh, came with it but in principle it was a market economy and at the time i bet you i don't have a way of knowing this but i bet you that the uh, the, the american occupiers were very happy that that guy basically won okay yes, yes. because otherwise you would have had another quasi socialist outpost uh, in the midst of europe so at the time it was perfectly good he was and, a product uh, of his time it was a product of his time the problem yes. is his ideas at some point his good to to the extent that they were good became commonplace okay was no revolution anymore and sort of and then sort of his followers his disciples they became sort of as all as often is the case with disciples you know um they became sort of third rate in some sense they became sort of preachers religious uh, and not mm -hmm. and not clear thinkers anymore i will say though People people tend to forget this in the day and age of the internet, but we know that Eucken was intellectually extremely isolated, just for logistical reasons. Right? You live in a country that was bombed, you know, and these guys just literally didn't have access to Keynes' writing so easily. It's not that they could go online and read the newest economic discourse uh, uh, out of Anglo-Saxon countries, right? Mm -hmm. So this guy was basically. Uh, um, um, uh, isolated and he c didn't even have the chance maybe he didn't seek it out that's fair probably he didn't seek it out but it wasn't in his face either the way it would have been uh, would have uh, the way it is today where you yeah. know you have Simon Rand Lewis and uh, uh, Paul Krugman writing blogs and telling you every other day you know how <laughs> crappy your economics is and that just wasn't the case in the 1950s so, obviously so Walter Oinken and let me spell his last name for our listeners it's E U C K E N Walter Oinken is I would argue from this discussion when I, I've read up on him that Walter Oinken is the most influential economist you've never heard of. Uh, that, that's for Americans because his influence, as you mentioned, it was in academia. It, it didn't, it, you know, the teachers of, of the policy leaders today, the Angela Merkel's, the, the the finance minister, all the leaders right now, they're you know their thinking is shaped by his his work. And so, Absolutely, that's not a bad way to put it. I will say he did have some. It wasn't co he was insular, but not quite completely insular. Mm -hmm. He did apparently know sort of the, what we would call the Chicago school, sort of you know. Yes, and some of his views were similar. So yes, his, exactly. His, his not completely right. ingenious new things. So, he, but he, I guess my point is he he is you know, if we look at the, some of the challenges the eurozone has faced, the ECB, it, it's 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 it, you know. Seeming uh, reluctance to do quantitative easing, get aggressive. It's, it's, it's. I mean, to me, one of its. You know, speaking of Paul Krugman, he calls. He's called uh, both. I think the Bank of uh, Central Bank of Sweden, as well as the ECB. He's he's in, he's invoked the term sado monetarism. <laughs> um, but 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 I, I think fairly in the case of 2011, the ECB raised interest rates twice, even though it had been full recovery. And and you look at it like, well, what were they thinking? And and. And I think it's the influence, you know, of, of individuals like, you know, Walter Oinken. So the thing is, no one in America, at least, maybe maybe even in, in, in the U.K., but, you know, in, in the West, you don't know. I've never heard of this individual, and I think most people haven't. Yet he, I would argue he is a huge influence. Um, his, his legacy is still being felt today in Europe. Just like today, you might argue Milton Friedman has a huge lasting influence in, in what some of the policies we do. Central central banks in most parts of the world have you know the legacy of Milton Friedman. His fingerprints are still there. Um, so this is it's fascinating, and it's just I think it's good to know somebody who these who these people are. All right, let, let's. Yes, it's, it's very rem reminiscent of Keynes' uh, saying of the defunct economist, right? You know, I, I thought it exactly. Yes, and uh, he's one of those uh, defunct economists that you may not be aware of. It's exactly. Yes, yeah, so it'd be good, something good for maybe a grad student to write a paper on in, in the program. Um, okay, so moving forward. Uh, we're using up a lot of our time here, but this has been a fascinating conversation. What, what do you see happening in Europe? I mean, both, let's say, um, overall, do you see the, the European Union staying together going forward? Or do you, 
do you see Brexit kind of being the first, you know, piece of the puzzle that's been taken out and it's weakened the rest of the puzzle? Um, or are you are you hopeful for the European Union? I am, I guess, a hopeless optimist. So yes, I'm going to okay. say I'm hopeful, but this is not based on any economics expertise. That's just sort of a gut feeling, um, simply because it's still clear that a lot of it, there's a lot of at stake here. I think, um, up including, you know, um, and that sort of, I'm still. I'm obviously not part of a generation that still has experienced the war, but at least I'm part of a generation that actually had people to talk to um, that had experienced the war. My grandfather, for example, mm -hmm. or at least my parents that grew up right in the post-war economy. Okay, and so sort of this has always driven. If you look at sort of that has always been. Uh, and for, for if you look at German chancellors, they have always been pro-European, and basically there's a lot of boilerplate there. But I buy the I buy it when they say at the end of the day, what drove them to U European sort of integration and unification was this 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 absolute uh, desire to never again make a war possible in Europe through integration because we're just uh, we're just so close together. Okay. Um, and, 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 and that's true that sort of as these generations die out, you know, this will be less of an issue. But I think it is the case. And, you know, while this may seem a bit, you know, far fetched that, you know, at some point Germans and, and, and French could, you know, uh, pull the guns and the tanks at each other again. Uh, you know, that's uh, we should always be wary of this. OK. And mm -hmm. it's it's so fundamental, I think. And most European politicians still know that, that, that at the end of the day, they have always pulled themselves together, even in the face of crisis. Now, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be a time of crisis where the internal, and partly because of the wrong the, the wrong way we do immigration, the internal tensions get so big that the whole thing blows up. You know, there is a path. There is now a, a path with positive probability where, you know, you have Marine Le Pen winning in France. You have the, yeah. the five, whatever, the five stars, I, I believe they're called, the Grillo guy in in Italy winning, you know, uh, at some point, this is just gone, it will explode. There's no question. And, um, but I don't want to even think that what will happen okay. then. It's just going to be, it's, it's just going to be a disaster. Um, well, let's, let's move forward. I want to look at some of your research. We have about 10 minutes left here. I want to transition into your work because you've done some interesting work yourself. Um, but it's been great to have you on to talk about German macroeconomics because it has been on people's minds. But let's talk about some of your work and, 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 I guess in the time I have left, maybe I, I got two areas I want to look at. And one of them is this idea of uncertainty. What role does uncertainty play in a recession? So you now you've looked at it both from a firm perspective and a household perspective. And there's been people like uh, Nick Bloom, Stephen Davis, Scott Baker, who've created this, you know, policy uncertainty index. And, you know, people who I, I generally, I, I sympathize. I, I'm a, you know, kind of a free market guy. Like I'm, I like supply side reforms, you know, uh, but there's been a, a group of that who, who've, from that perspective, you've argued it's it's a lot of uncertainty that's happened since 2008 that explains a slow recovery, and I haven't been entirely convinced by that. And and I'm wondering what did you find is is uncertainty itself a cause or is it a, a consequence of the recession or is it a bit of both? Um, well, that's the that's the 60 million dollar question, uh, isn't it? Um, yes. Um, so I would say what we know is. So let me let me step just I know we are running out of time, but let me just step mm -hmm. back a bit. Sort of the, as you probably know and your listeners know uh, about macroeconomics, the big sort of the big puzzle that sort of macroeconomists um, are still struggling with is uh, uh, finding the ultimate root causes of of fluctuations. Okay, mm -hmm. we know a lot how you know, once we assume a certain source of a fluctuation, what that does to the economy, how that propagates, how that is amplified, okay? That we understand very well, uh, for example, with monetary policy shocks. But what are the ultimate shocks that ultimately drive uh, uh, aggregate fluctuations? So and sort of none of the proposed, whether monetary policy shock, fiscal policy shocks, technology shocks, all kinds of demand shocks have been super convincing or they have all problems uh, attached mm -hmm. to them. 
and, and this is not to say that they don't uh, all have to, uh, a role to play, obviously. And so sort of every, I, I want to say sort of every five, six years or 10 years, maybe, you see a new shock candidate popping up in macroeconomics. I mean, yeah. it's literally that case. So we had the new shock debate. Uh, some of you, uh, uh, you might have followed that. Yeah. And so uh, somewhat in parallel came the uncertainty uh, shock debate. And the intuition is kind of clear. It's an old intuition. If you have... Uh, uh, investments to make that have a certain irreversibility to them that you can't undo immediately or that are costly to undo, you know, in a more uncertain environment, you're just going to wait uh, until you sort of pay that sunk cost uh, and lose potentially. That's sort of a very intuitive mechanism. Um, I guess you don't need to, you can work out the math, but I think it's very intuitive that you get these wait yeah. and see effects. And so, you know, people have argued that this is exactly what could happen with increased uncertainty. Uh, you know, people, um, uh, just wait and see, okay, Bec uh, have this sort of this delayed investment, delayed hiring, and that itself could lead uh, uh, to recessions. Here's what we know, I would say. What we know is, and this is a new business cycle fact that I think wasn't known in the uh, sort of 10 years ago, that sort of started with the work uh, of Nick Blooms. And, you know, I've contributed some of this with my own publication to this work. We have established relatively clearly that Pretty much any proxy, uncertainty is difficult to measure, and that's sort of a, a whole different story. But mm -hmm. any any proxy that we throw at it, uncertainty, risk, however you want to call it, any second moment, so to speak, yeah, mm -hmm. is uh, that we can measure is essential is is robustly countercyclical. That we know. So it is it is true that all these proxies to measure uncertainty and risk are higher in recessions than they are in booms. Okay. And so this is a new uh, Bissell cycle fact. Okay, that's very well established. I would say there's no doubt about it. So the question is then, what do we make of this? Does that mean that indeed is the cause or an effect or, or simply an effect uh, of recessions? Ultimately, I still think we don't know, quite frankly. I have argued a lot in my literature that there is a big chunk of it is that uncertainty is just a, what I've called an epiphenomenon. It's something that's, a cause, that's ultimately caused by recessions uh, or, or downturns in, in, in a more general sense and not really the uh, 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 sort of a, a genuine uh, a genuine cause. Um, and uh, uh, there are hints to this. If you look at the data, uncertainty tends to actually, you know, lead, lag the recessions a bit, uh, you know. Um, and so there are hints of this in the data. Um, that, But ultimately, as always in macroeconomic questions, causality is just hard to settle because we can't do experiments, right? We can't right. sort of causally shock the economy with an uncertainty shock and then see what happens. Right. Uh, that's so the just identification not, problem. That, yeah, that the identification problem in yes. macro is massive and that that leads to uh, that leads to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, it's easy to tell a story. Um, you know, assume there is some great recession, and let's assume it's caused by really bad monetary policy. You know, let, let's repeat the 1930s. Let's, let's get down to where we have a huge collapse in the real activity. You know, even in a situation like that, uncertain. You would think, you know, just your priors and intuition would say uncertainty would increase, even though it's not a cause. You would expect uncertainty as a byproduct, as a consequence, to go up. And so the the question is, how how powerful of an explanation can that be on its own as as a as a driver of that. And I, you know, I've read some arguments for like the 1930s that um, like some of the New Deal legislation seemed really radical at the time, may have been kind of a regime change. But it's, it's again, it's not clear to me that we have a good understanding. And I think that's what you're echoing. Let me move on in the time we have left to, to one other issue. And this one I, I found real interesting um, and kind of uh, went up against my prior. And this is what you found about inflation expectations and people's desire to spend. Uh, money. So, so tell us, what, what would theory tell you? I mean, kind of, a, you know, Econ 101, we talk about shoe leather costs, right? And then what did you actually find in the data? So, so we wanted to test sort of, this is sort of an exercise in going back to sort of methodologically and going back to rather than sort of testing whole DSGE models, uh, mm -hmm. dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models with a lot of Bayesian estimation, um, you know, there's a, a sort of an alternative tradition in economics to test sort of simple elements of standard models, specific equations, if you wish, specific mechanisms. And so uh, if you uh, if uh, if people remember sort of the way in sort of standard neo-Keynesian macroeconomics, at least um, uh, the transmission me mechanism, both for monetary policy and fiscal policy, how it works is not sort of the old style ISLM 
mechanism that you know the government spends more money therefore income goes up and 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 therefore people consume more this is not present at all the uh, in the neo keynesian model the neo keynesian mo model is both for monetary policy and fiscal policy works as as follows that you know as economy as uh, especially for fiscal policy for example as firms want to produce more they have to do this at a higher marginal cost so they want to drive up prices but because of some stickiness in these prices they actually delay this price adjustment so you get inflation expectations and these inflation expectations okay and the same is true a bit more directly for monetary policy th these inflation expectations then lead to declines in the real interest rate if the nominal interest rates are not counteracted which especially would be the case in the zero lower bound kind of environment right yep. mm -hmm. where, where you wouldn't change the nominal rate so the real rate would be determined by sort of the negative of the um, of the of the inflation expectations. So you increase fl inflation expectations, the real weight goes down, that generates aggregate demand, and that basically gives you the boom. That's the mechanism in most standard models that we used to think about stabilization policy. So we wanted to just know, is it true, okay? Is it true that if, if in the cross-section, that is, if households have higher inflation expectations, and we don't make a causal statement here uh, at all, but we just looked at, um, you know, is it true that in the cross-section, uh, the households that have higher inflation expectations tend to also have a higher inclination to buy durables. And you can do this because the Michigan Survey of Consumers basically asks about both questions. They ask about their subjective inflation expectations and whether they think it's a good time to buy durables, okay? And and and, and cars and houses. There are very there is variance of that question. And the answer is the correlation is essentially zero. And it doesn't matter whether you are in a zero lower bound episode or before. It doesn't play a role. It's 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 zero. If anything, it's a bit negative, but really it's a statistical zero. With one exception. Okay, with one exception, and that's interesting. The people that seem to be very much informed about the economy. And we proxy this by people that, you know, kind of have good inflation expectations sort of twice in a row, because some of these households you get to observe twice in a row in the Michigan survey. But get in so the people that observe the economy, they have the standard effect. They, you, there you can see their inflation expectations would, so that they understand monetary policy. Apparently, they understand the mechanism. They behave accordingly. But sort of what you also find, and that's sort of, and that's that's, I think, you fast, almost even more interesting. I would argue, is that so you could a lot of people could argue, you know, these survey data, people don't know anything, you know, and they don't know what what, what they answer. They're really bored. They want to go to dinner. They're really annoyed by these people that call them up. Of, Okay, fine. Um, but if you, if you look at it, actually, sort of in most other aspects, people behave or, or at least answer in a way that's completely consistent with economic theory, for example. They will tell you if they have high, better business expectations, better financial expectations for themselves, for themselves, lower unemployment expectations, they will actually spend more. So the the, quant the traditional quantity quantity mechanism that you know sort of ex current and expected higher income that sort of the old Keynesian transmission mechanism that doesn't go through inflation expectations that's alive and well in the data okay uh, at least in the sense that people respond to this with higher willingness to buy and that's sort of that's sort of this this counterpoint between sort of how you know the neo Keynesian uh, mechanism through inflation expectations versus the more old Keynesian uh, ISLM if you wish. Uh, and uh, or, or multiplier effect through income and income expectations. That sort of contrast that is, that we found in the data to me was striking, and that, and that 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 made me in some sense a bit of an old Keynesian, actually. Well, I'm, I'm so, sure uh, Paul, Paul Krugman would love to hear that because he keeps, if you've been reading him, he keeps saying, "Hey, the old ISLO model was." Powerful during the Great Recession. I wouldn't go that far. The ISLM model is a good heuristic. We still need it's still a crappy model in terms of economics. <laughs> right. So we need to when we find this when we find that this mechanism is true in the data, we need to think harder about why why is it that this should be the case. We need, in other words, better and more modern right. micro foundations well, in a way that that we would be satisfied. Well, here I mean, this surprised me. Your results really surprised me. And I, I guess my question, um, you know, is. What was the range on the inflation expectations? Is this, is this something that maybe kind of a, maybe a threshold effect that, with you know, if it's low to medium ranged inflation, that you know, it, the people don't respond because their inflation. No, is no, we we, we run sort of nonlinear specifications. Okay. Again, the only thing that worked is sort of this putatively informed, sort of macro visits that actually observe the economy, well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will say though, I will say, there is another paper out there. Um, um, uh, by um, Michael Weber, another German actually from the Chicago booth, and his team, 
they look at sort of a slightly different exercise. They can claim also much more causality, but they look, there was a, in 2005, again in Germany, there was sort of a, a, a pre-announced VAT increase mm -hmm. uh, 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 after, after an election. And before the election, uh, everyone promised there wouldn't be any tax increases. And then they came in, the grand coalition as, uh, between social democrats and conservatives came in. They actually, they, they, before they said no tax increases, and then they raised uh, VAT by 3% or something. And But they did it in a way that they said it goes into effect two years later. Okay. okay. And sort of there you have, an, by what you see, you have an immediate and therefore pretty much causal effect in inflation and inflation expectations, immediate mm -hmm. reflecting this VAT thing. And there they actually find the, the normal response, the, the, the stimulative response, especially for drawbacks. But I would argue, of course, so in other words, uh, sort of our conclusion, uh, sort of taking two, uh, these two papers together, if that's what you want to do, if you, if you think that inflation expectation management gets you uh, stabilization policy, uh, the, the sort of the, the right mechanisms, you really need to talk about it. it's a salient, right? This VAT experiment was super salient. Everyone, this was after an election. The, 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 basically, the, the, the electorate got hosed because they were promised no tax increases. Then they got the 3% 3, 3 increase. So this was all over the news. Everyone knew about it, okay? And so if you want to do this, then, then you really need to talk about it in a way that monetary policy maybe even can't. Okay, so I think there's sort of a bit of a discrepancy also between fiscal policy and monetary policy, because, you know, at the end of the day, not many people listen to uh, what they do uh, at the board. Right. This is sort of always the sort of the the, uh, the talk of the in crowd a bit. And, and but you need to reach Main Street if you if you want to do this in a way that maybe with these unconventional fiscal policy measures through sales tax increases. Well, I guess we don't have that in the U.S. at the federal level, but you know something unconventional on the fiscal side that you that you might actually reach people much more. So to me, it, at the end of the day, I would argue it's a salience issue. It's not that people don't necessarily understand this mechanism. For example, they do what, what we do under, what we see they do understand is relative price increases. So they know exactly. They will tell you if they expect house prices house prices relative to increase. They, then they will argue that now is a good a time to buy a house. So they totally understand relative prices and relative price increases. What, what I think is lacking is sort of a general understanding of increases in the general price level, which is sort of a, a relative price, not sort of uh, uh, necessarily within periods, but sort of across periods. That's difficult, and that is something that you need, would need to communicate in terms if you wanted to go down that route with monetary policy. All right. Well, thank you. That's been a lot of fun discussing this. Our guest today has been Rudy Bachman of Notre Dame. Rudy, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It was great. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.